Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I am your host, Stephen Pinecker, and just a reminder, folks, this month's book giveaway is a preparatory redemption reading Alma 12 through 13, edited by my friends Matthew Bowman and Rosemary uh, Demos. Uh, as you all know, is that Bridget Jack, Jack, Jack Jeffries, who wrote the final paper in here, and I'll get this up here, is called Called and ordained a priesthood of all believers in Alma 13. Bridget is a graduate of Brigham Young University. She is a fellow evangelical who is currently working on her PhD at Trinity Evangelical University just outside Chicago. And uh, she sent me an extra copy, so that's why we're giving it away. So it's really good because it talks about how the Book of Mormon teaches a concept of the Protestant concept of the priesthood of all believers. So that's this month's book drawing. Yeah. In the uh, description, we'll have uh, my email, mormonbookreviews at gmail.com. And in the in the subject heading, make sure you put down July book giveaway or July contest and put your name and address in the email. So um, I'm very excited about this next guest because did you know, folks, that for over 20 years, there has been a group based primarily out of Missouri that has been doing uh, almost every year an expedition to Southern Mexico to, uh, they believe they have found the Hill Camorra. And this is a very fascinating story. This this is, a, I, I've heard about you guys about 10, 15 years ago. And I was like, man, there's, and, and this is the crazy part, folks. This is community of Christ people. So one, it was surprising that there are people going down that think they, they may have found the Hill Camorra. But we actually have people who are members of the community of Christ who still believe that the Book of Mormon is literal history. So I often, I always wonder, wonder what that group's up to. Well, I finally got to run into you last time I was in Independence, Missouri. Uh, David, uh, David Brown, welcome to the program. Hey, thank you, Stephen. I've, I've been looking forward to this since we met uh, when you were up for that uh, conference. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here on this program and to share some of the things that we've been doing through the years. That's great. Now, folks, there's a little bit of a video issues that we're having here, but the audio is good. So, and we're going to be doing a slide presentation, so it shouldn't be too much of an issue. He might bounce in and out now and then, but no biggie, we'll, we'll power through this. Now, one of the things that you sent me a copy of your book, A Messiah Among the Maya, A Case for Christianity in Pre-Columbia, Colombian America. Um, actually, before, though, we talk about the actual expedition and what you're doing, I'd like for you to tell a little bit about yourself. Give your background. You are uh, somebody who's been in the community of Christ for, I'm assuming, a lifelong member, and you are a pastor of a congregation in uh, the, called the Buckner Congregation uh, in Missouri. So maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself and your church. Sure. Um, yeah, as you alluded, uh, our family has been a part of the restoration. Um, we had family members that were converted in the 1870s up in Ontario, Canada. Okay. And as the church began to develop and, and eventually went into Lamoni uh, in Iowa and then down to Independence, our family followed along. And uh, my grandfather moved into Independence about a, the early 1920s. And so uh, my my parents actually lived out here in eastern Jackson County, and I was born into the church uh, uh, here at Buckner. Buckner was uh, became a congregation in 1955, and I was born in 1958. It was part of growing up here. We had a good, uh, solid gate. Uh, was mostly farmers. It was farmer mentality, kind of the just being real and rational about what the scriptures say and let's follow what that says and so um i've, I've been with them all I went through youth group and young adulthood and only in 1987 is when we experienced the split here uh we lost almost the entire congregation there were a few of us that stayed with uh, the the main church at the time which was the esco and and we started um continuing on here at at buckner and then through the years uh, eventually i was called to the office of priest in 98 and then to elder in 2007 and i became pastor here in 2011 and have been pastor since that time yep. so i mean that's that's the side of it 
Yeah. So just just because it broke up a little bit. So you were born in the RLDS church. Uh, you were, you, were, you So and you were born in 1958. Your congregation started in 1955. And what happened was is that, it, that when in 1984, when the RLDS decided to um, ordain female priests, as well as a few other things that were happening on with the church, that there was a split and about a quarter to a third of the people left uh, the RLDS church to form these independent groups. And uh, so a vast majority of the people that were part of the Buckner congregation, because they sued and they weren't able to keep take keep the building or anything like that, they had to move out. And so you guys stayed, but you guys would say that you are actually kind of like conservatives uh, who still believe in the Book of Mormon, still believe in the old school RLDS church that you were born into. And you're kind of almost almost seen as a, like a remnant within the community of Christ of, of true believers. Would that be a, a fair assessment? That is a fair assessment. Okay. And um, as a result of the loss of the congregation, we had close to 400 members here when that split occurred. And when we started back up, we were probably at one-tenth of that, about 30 and 40 people. Um, and, and we've maintained, you know, we've grown through the years. We're up to about 100 on the rolls and so on, and, and about a, a weekly attendance of 25 to 30. But what's happened through the years is because of the, of the heartache and the loss that happened because of that split, I, I firmly believe God worked in my heart to develop a heart for bringing people together. You know, we don't, we don't have to see, we're all family. We don't have to see eye to eye on all the minutia and details of things. We, we believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and the Savior. Uh, we believe that there's a calling for these last days. He's given us some wonderful things with the Book of Mormon and a, a way to move forward in a unification that's going to glorify him. It's not about us. It's about him. And so uh, that's what that's really what my heart is. And in 2015, we began working with other um, restoration churches here in the area on creating a way for us to get together and share and so for a while, we for several years now, eight years, we've been doing tent revivals in the fall. We've been sharing in prayer meetings and, and testifying to each other of what God's doing in our lives and, and uplifting one another in prayer. So um, it, it's a wonderful experience in that regard. And we find that, that there, most people of the restoration are open to that. Let's share what we have in common. Well, it's interesting because when we weren't, you you didn't actually meet me at the Book of Mormon rally, but I was there to speak at that. And that's kind of a similar group that's doing, but Patrick McKay and his brother, that they're they're doing a similar thing where they're trying to get all the different uh, branches of the restoration together, all the Book of Mormon believing groups together and having these conversations and focusing on the areas that there's commonality. So it seems that there's probably a real appetite for that in, in the greater independence area, as well as in the restoration as a whole. Yeah, I think so, for sure. Um, most people aren't, aren't wanting to be so hardline that they have to start saying, no, you can't be a part of this. That this really is just for us, kind of. Um, most people love and have relationships beyond the doctrine, you know, the, the minutia of the doctrine. And so, yeah, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for those opportunities to, to share with each other and to strengthen one another. So one of these things, that, like I said, getting back to is what you've been doing for 20 plus years now, as you've been doing, leading these expeditions and it actually was kind of informal. And then you actually became a, a not-for-profit organization called the Hill Kimura uh, Expedition Incorporated. Is that what it's called? Yeah, Hill Kimura Expedition Team. Correct. Okay. And uh, so and so, I'm going to leave links in the description, by the way, to their website. And for those of you who'd like to support their work and everything like that, because it's really interesting because, like, you know, I'm pretty well known for, on my channel for having some of the major hot heartlanders come on my program, like Rod Meldrum and Jonathan Neville and others. And so there's been a real, um, there's a lot of people who are heartlanders that are, are big fans of my program. And I've also had Brent Brent Gardner on, who's who's with Fair Mormon or for Fair Latter-day Saints. 
and he's one of the leading proponents of the Mesoamerican model in the Utah branch. What a lot of people don't realize is that the uh, the idea of the Meso limited geography Mesoamerican model actually came out of your church by a gentleman by uh, E.L. Hills, right? Uh, is that his, uh, Hills was his last name. And he uh, was the one that came out with the limited geography model circa around 1914. He started circulating those pamphlets you know, from 1914 to 1919 and uh, started expounding on this idea that the Book of Mormon events took place in, in, in Mesoamerica. And then it would be a few decades later that people within the LD, the Utah branch would start adopting this idea as well. So and it's interesting how uh, your church has had a major impact on the Utah branch's view of where they think it happened. Now, of course, the Heartlander movement is, is growing and more and more people are pay, paying close attention to that. But for a very, very long time, in Book of Mormon editions that were printed by the Utah branch, had uh, images from Mayan ruin, ruins and Mesoamerica images and in, in, in their you know, murals and everything. So it almost was almost a de facto position that the Mesoamerican model was the model that the Utah church was was teaching. Um, is that pretty fair history there? That is. That's fair history, yes. And so it's a fascinating story how your church had an influence. And now you guys have been for 20 plus years doing this expedition. And so the question, really, I just, I just want to ask you, dude, what, what made you decide to do this? Was this a, do you feel this was like a spiritual calling? Now, in the beginning of your book, you actually talk about how there were murals found that kind of showed some Chris, Christian stories being told in a Mayan context, and that is not very well known because it's almost like they're almost too Christian. And so you think, was that the impetus for doing these expeditions? You felt like there was, you guys could find the evidence you needed? No, the impetus actually started with Neil Steedy. Um, Neil Steedy's father, Harry Steedy, was the pastor of Buckner Congregation from like 1972 to 1978. And so that was right in the heart of the time when I was in youth group. And so I grew up knowing about Neil Steedy. As a matter of fact, he had an experience down at the place that we believe is the hill in 1972. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, he was going off of some that had been done by Wayne Simmons, Neil Simmons, who had done an ethnography uh, uh, report. They had found a report of an ethnography that had been done of this region back in the 1930s. And these people of that region, what we call the Northern Waka around Jalapa de Dias and Cerro Rabon, which is where we believe this is located, the Hill Camorra South is located. Um, they had a legend about these three men who would show up in the spring and they would come into the region, they would go towards the hill, and people would ask them what they're doing, they're, they're checking up on the national treasure. And then they would see them go up the hill and no one ever saw them come down. Um, and so based on that, Neil went there in 1972 and had an experience there. It was rather profound. It was a spiritual experience. And he came back and shared that with a lot of congregations in, this, in the independence area. Well. Um, that that really kind of strengthened through the years. And then in about 2001, our congregation was, was studying the Book of Mormon and Neil was coming in every now and then and doing a little presentation. Well, we decided to take a bus trip down to Mexico and see the sites and ruins he's talking about. And Neil went with us, he was our guide. And part of that was going to the hill. And because of the experience that several of the people had at the Hill um, in, in 2001, the, the decision was made, hey, let's see if we can't further this along. I mean, if, if God really wants to bring these points forth at some point in time, then there needs to be a group of people who are prepared to receive those plates. And so you have to put yourself in proper position to receive it if you want to be a part of that movement. 
So that's what we decided. We're going to go down. We're going to research the area. We're going to find out what we can. We're going to see if there's any likely places where the, the plates might be located around the hill. And so that started 2002, actually going down and, and going up on the hill and researching and looking at things. Um, so it was in 2005 that we actually had pivotal year, I would say. Uh, they had found something that was that was uh, interesting because they, they had found married Ogam, which is a script used by the Maya um, that was written on a stone, but it was cryptic. Um, it didn't have any particular clear message of any kind. And so we went back in 2005. We were we had 15 or 16 people with us. We were going to go up on the hill. And if I may, I'll, I'll share my screen with you and kind of show you. Sure. So while, um, while you're do, getting this up, you, yeah. you're talking about uh, Neil Steedy. And I actually got to meet him um, when we were at the same, at the Stone Church. He was given a presentation at the historic Stone Church on the Sunday evening. And uh -huh. uh, an interesting guy. So basically, when you talk about these three people around, and I guess I heard it's around April 6th of every year. These three people, which we would understand within the uh, understanding of Mormon theology, would most likely be the three Nephites, um, yeah. would make their appearance um, around April 6th every year to the people, climb up the hill, and would not be seen uh, coming down. Is that is that uh, about right? That is. That's correct. Okay, interesting. So oh, just so you know, folks, this photo that you're looking at, the first slide here, um, that is what you believe is Hill Cumorah. Correct. Okay, well, let's talk talk a little, go, go through the, the slides here to, to explain okay. it to the audience. So yeah, this, did that move? Did that move forward yep. to the second? Yep. Like, okay, so yeah, this is Hill Cumorah, what we believe is Hill Cumorah. It's Sarah Rabone. Um, it is one of the most prominent features in the area. It's amazing. It's actually uh, 6,000 feet above sea level is where the top of that mountain is, which means it's about 5,600 feet above the river that's down below it. What you see there um, as a sheer cliff is about 3,000 feet. Um, so the skirt of the mountain goes up at a pretty steep angle, and then it's about a 3,000 foot cliff face. So in 2005, we went down here with the hope of, of again, furthering our research. And we started out by having a prayer service and communion service there on the hill. And so part of the preparation for the communion service was everybody broke up and went out to different places for a little meditation time. And when that happened, we had a bunch of um, police show up with their weapons, some of them automatic weapons, and asking who's the leader of the group. And of course, everybody pointed over to Neil Steedy because he really was the only one who was familiar with the area and could speak fluent Spanish. Um, so Neil and another fellow went with the police, went into town, and we went on, we had our communion service, didn't hear from him, he didn't come back, we didn't know what was going on. We ended up going into town and found out that they were being detained. And they were- Now, kind of, Neil, they is were Neil being, the one with the beard in this photograph? Uh, he's not actually in the photograph. Oh, okay, okay. I do have another photograph with him in it. Okay. Um, now, this was a communion after he had been taken off into town. Okay, wow. <laughs> And so, yeah, so when we got into town, uh, you can kind of see the people behind the fence here. Um, they weren't necessarily thrown in jail, but they were being detained. They were not being allowed to leave. Okay. And as a matter of fact, uh, this gentleman who's up there at the fence right now, he's pretty much saying, you need to just keep on going, go back to Tushtepec, which is about 40 kilometers away. He said, go back to Tushtepec before you become guilty by association. Um, and you're detained too. So we all went back to Tushtepec waiting to hear from our friends. Well, as it turned out, we couldn't get cell service directly from them to the hotel. And this is 2006. So there weren't that many cell phones out there to begin with among the group. But it turned out that by, by 
one of our crew there in Jalapa telephoning to Missouri, then that person could relay messages to us in Tustepec. And so we were getting intermittent messages. They're being detained. They may be coming home tonight. Then it was, then it was no, they're not coming home tonight. They're being detained until tomorrow. And the, the gentleman I was with, Ron Van Fleet, was, was my roomie at, the, at that trip. And he turned to me after, just after we got that news. And he said, they're on their way here. And in my mind, I'm thinking, Ron, you, didn't you just hear what they said? <laughs> he said, no. And he kind of looked at me. I he knew what I was thinking. He said, they're on their way here. Well, about 15 minutes later, we got a phone call. And the phone call was the mayor and the police are bringing our, our guys back and they have someone with them who needs medical attention. Uh, apparently there was a girl who had been bitten by a fur lance and anyone from the area down there knows that it, it's, it's one of the most poisonous snakes in that particular region. Um, and she'd been bitten on the foot. So we were told to prepare and, and have a, a chair for her out there in front of the hotel and to have our medical bag ready and so on. We had a, a couple of people who were paramedics or who'd been medically trained. And um, so as it turns out, here they all roll in. You got the police, you got the mayor, you got the parents of this particular girl and the girl. And they all come in to the uh, portico under the hotel and we set the girl down and uh, we have people who are starting to look at, at her foot to make sure things are okay. Well, we come to find out at that point, she'd already had snake venom, um, uh, ant venom that had been administered. And that, um, however, she was not looking good. She was ashen gray. She was lethargic. She, that you knew something was going on and the antivenom wasn't having an impact as of, as of yet. So we talked with the family and got permission. We administered to her through the administration ordinance. And, and then while after that was complete, we found out how much the, the family had spent to pay for that antivenom. And Neil turned around and said, you know, we need about 5,000 pesos. They, they put out a lot of money for this. And so we collected up a bunch of pesos and gave it to the family. And within, within about 20 minutes, there was this marked change. The color came back in this girl's face. Um, she was becoming more animated. And everyone who was there, the, the mayor and his wife and the family, the police, they were like, oh my gosh, what's happened? <laughs> well, we, they went ahead and they left. And we had no idea the impact that that had had we had just made or that god had just made in that moment um the next morning we're setting at breakfast and and just real and, quick I, I noticed in your slideshow you have a picture of that little is that the little girl in the picture there is right wanna, here okay yeah, that's, that's, that's the one that was yeah, yeah that's catalina correct okay. that's her okay. yes so the mayor from Jalapa de Diaz and his wife come in and they start talking with us and they apologize uh, for detaining us that um, and we had a wonderful dialogue with with them and really established a, a great rapport with them. Um, well, as they're leaving, in comes the newspaper and the newspaper finds out about all this. And they end up interviewing Neil. Um, this particular, this is what was printed on April 12th of that year, basically saying that this, this group of people from the United States are down here doing research because they believe that there's sacred Mayan writings in Cerro Rabon. So we're getting our message out now to the whole, to the whole area through this newspaper. 
And um, uh, so that interview went on. And, and then when that was over, in walk the federales, uh, the gobernacion, uh, who are the, the official federal agents for Mexico. And they start talking with us and they apologize to us. And they are asking us if we're going to plan on suing them. And I mean, it was just, it was an amazing conversation that we had with them. Neil basically shared the same story with every group that we talked with that day, as far as why we're there, what we have found, the evidences, why we think that this is the place. And um, as it turns out, uh, oh, by the way, the Gobernacion, the, the, the Federales, when they left, they, they told us, Vayas con Dios, which is go with God. And, and to have someone from the Mexican government actually say something about being with God or, or, or giving a blessing, so to speak, uh, it's a big deal. Uh, the, the people who were in the newspapers stayed around. They were over at like a, a table over and heard that. And they were like, wow. So th this was a whole God moment that happened. And as it turned out, a, a day later, these same policemen that had come up with the hill with the automatic weapons, now were out at the hill helping us take all of our equipment up to our base camp <laughs> where and um, taking our water up there and all of that. So uh, as it turned out, um, we, we ended up having wonderful, warm relationships with all these people. This is, uh, again, Catalina and her father in front of their house there in Jalapa de Dias. And uh, what happened was after that point, we shifted in what we did. Uh, we started becoming more attached with the people of the region and, and had relationships with them. But God also was kind of telling us, it's not time yet. I need you to do other things. So we started then researching um, a lot of the other things that Neil had put into place. He had discovered what's called a, a Mosiah Maya matrix. In other words, he found Mosiah as a person in the Mayan history. And so with taking Mosiah and overlaying him on the Mayan history at Yashitlan, he discovered that. Zarahemla is, or Yashi Lan is Zarahemla. It's right there on the Inter River. And, and going from that as a fixed point, we then began to go look at other places that are geographical clues and that had some um, historical evidences that matched Book of Mormon relationships with Zarahemla. So, yeah, that's, that's what we began to do. We began to move out and, and move into other research. So through the years, we've developed an incredible body of knowledge that we were trying to find a forum to share, but not quite sure, um, kind of waiting on God, too, as to when it's time to share it. And it feels like we're getting into that period. Um, doors are opening. Things are happening where uh, it seems like we, we're going to have an audience because I believe, uh, Stephen, that the Book of Mormon, even though it's come through the restoration movement, the Book of Mormon is not a uh, proprietary document for the restoration. It's going to the world. It's going to be a book just as ecumenical as the Bible. People are going to Ezekiel 37 alludes to that, that the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph will become one in thine hand. And uh, the, the whole world is going to have both books as a reference, as a spiritual reference. So, yeah, so that's very anyway. fascinating. It's a great story. And I so basically, yeah. You this this became important because you kind of had had that turning point where the, now you've established uh, rapport and relationships with the local community. So they're probably very happy to see you come down there every year 
and they seem to embrace a lot of what you're trying to do. And so when you guys see these things happening, you're also looking at it as kind of confirmation that you feel that you're on the right path and that these doors are being opened to you at this time, um, because many people believe that we live in the latter days. And as a result of that, obviously, that there would be certain things that would come forth um, that one would expect. And so there's this idea, like, for instance, that you, you referenced like the national treasure. The idea is, is that there's the possibility exists that we might find like what we could call the Nephite Hall of Records uh, or some sort of, sure. of thing within the hill that might actually reveal to the world. Uh, the, the, uh, this would, of course, change world history. And, and so you feel like you almost feel like God is hand is on this and that he's that you guys are playing a role to kind of usher forth uh, the latter days in one sense. That's correct. And, and we do, we, we've been working with an archaeologist in the Mexico region. Uh, we have located a, a place that we feel is a, is a prime possibility for where these plates are located. Mormon's library. And, and most restoration people understand this concept. Uh, Mormon was sent to Hill Shim to recover all the records that had been kept from uh, the time that Lehi left the room and the brass plates. So you had the brass plates, you had the large records of Nephi, the small book of Nephi, and you know multiple other uh, records. And he was instructed from that collection of history to abridge, create this shortened version that, that became then the plates that Joseph Smith translated into the Book of Mormon. But, but more, uh, Mormon says he buried the plates in the hill Cumorah. And, and then he handed the abridgment and the 24 plates of ether to his son Moroni to finish up. And um, so all of this is going on, but we feel like that we have found the location where those plates may well be located. And we've got some pretty strong indications because of its location and its site or its, its, um, its view of what would have been that battlefield, that large battlefield. Uh, it would have been a good strategic location to see the the movement of troops or the elements that needed to trigger to to bring successful ended up being an unsuccessful um, defense for the Nephites. Um, both that and the fact that uh, we've got a pretty solid hit on metal at that location, and it's it's hard to. I mean, who knows? Maybe it's Cortez's camps, right? Maybe Cortez's group, when they were going up to uh, to Nochitlan, uh, buried some cannons so that they would have something to retreat back to <laughs> um, if if they weren't successful up above in the in the higher elevations. So, um, but some, there's something. There. So we've been in contact with Ina. We've we've contacted them. Uh, we're looking for a university program that has a um, an anthropological or an anthropology program where they could be a sponsor on this and then we can start moving forward so um, anyway it's 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 exciting the possibilities are exciting so and, and one of the things is too is you did you know uh, i know neil 3d he puts out a, a journal that's a, that's an archaeological journal. In this book, you're not even really using the Book of Mormon. You're not even talking about the Book of Mormon. You're just talking about the traditions and also some of the some of the artwork that seems to indicate some Christian influence on some of the Mayan stellas. Um, so what you guys are trying to do is not just make this a faithful like thing, but you want to bring scientific rigor to this as well and bring in you know professional archaeologists and stuff like that so that they could apply the best practices so that when you do get a permit to uh, do some excavations that you're doing it uh, correctly. Correct. Uh, what we believe is that what's going to happen with the Book of Mormon is similar to what happened with the, the Old Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1948. Um, they, they spent years and years recovering those and then starting, and it's only been in the last uh, 15, 20 years that we've actually got large publications of faithful translations of those fragments that have been found. But they are providing solid confirmation as to the accuracy of scripture that we have received through the Old Testament, especially. Um, it, it, it's indicated that it's probably about 200, B or 200 AD when it was written, but obviously those are also copies from other copies from somewhere. So uh, anyway, that like that, we believe, and, and this goes back to the, um, the prophecy Joseph Smith had given concerning Enoch in the last days, and he talks about righteousness coming down out of heaven and truth coming forth out of the earth. And truth and righteousness will sweep the earth as with a flood, right? Well, the, the righteousness out of heaven is movement, I believe, of what's going on that began with Joseph Smith and his um, interaction with, with God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the actual translation of the Book of Mormon. That's the righteousness out of heaven. But the tr truth coming forth out of the earth is all of the evidences of the people of the Golden Age and and the evidences of Mormon and this this huge library that he had that actually provides a then factual foundation for the truth that's actually in the Book of Mormon that's in, embedded there. So that being the case, what we have done is we're putting ourselves in a position to be the conduit, to be something that's that's putting the the truth that's in the earth um, channeled into the hands of archaeologists who will be more likely to provide us with a faithful translation or a faithful factual investigation into what these are, who wrote them, the script that's written on them, that's, uh, we're going to find the reformed Egyptian all over the place inside of it. Well, in the brass plates, the brass plates are going to be there. That's going to be amazing. That is a incredible connection of the new world to the old world. Uh, and, and who's going to be able to dispute that? And But it's going to be, I think, important that it's not a restoration group that digs the hole and bring those out. That if, if a restoration group does that, it's going to cast all kinds of doubt on the validity of what's being done as far as how those are being translated and researched and so on. If we put the archaeologists who are we, we are anticipating they'll be objective, if we put this into their hands and let them do the dig, let them do their research, um, their disinterested uh, efforts to understand what's in the ground and then to translate it, then you have a, a more solid foundation for um, being able to say, yep, Joseph Smith was inspired. This wasn't his imagination, is his 19th century imagination uh, taking over. Yeah, well, it would, so, rewrite, it would rewrite history. Mm -hmm. Uh, the brass plates could also be used to compare our modern uh, Old Testament translations to see how accurate it is. You got because they'll have an even older uh, thing to go by. Um, then, then if the Book of Mormon is proven to be, I always tell people, I tell evangelicals this. I said, and again, I'm just I'm speaking as an outsider here, but I just say, imagine if the Book of Mormon were to be proven to be true, it actually will give it, it will actually strengthen the uh, witness of the Bible because now it will be another ancient document. And, and so it actually will strengthen the Bible as well. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Utah is the one true church. It just means that we have a document that seems to be an, that's ancient that would then verify that the Bible is true and also verify that the Book of Mormon is true. 
And uh, so, so that that's why it would be so earth shattering is if this were to be found and be done in a way that's done, a sci- you know, with the correct scientific ways of doing it, as opposed to a bunch of amateurs, um, it would rewrite, uh, it would rewrite history. <laughs> Absolutely. Amen and amen. Uh, it, it would. And, and the thing is, it would actually fulfill what everything that the Bible, both the Old Testament, what they prophesied about, and the New Testament, what they testified about, it would fulfill it because the story of the old world and what the Bible tells us is a Jesus who's, who was born, who had a ministry, who died on a cross, and who was put in a tomb, and then there's this handful of people who witnessed that the tomb was empty. Um, the other non-believers are still left like, yeah, yeah, whatever, that's a myth. You know, somebody stole the body, took it off. But what the new world testifies is a risen Jesus Christ. Um, and, and, and that's the uniqueness of the Book of Mormon. The fact that Christ came here, he provided a ministry that in, in essence mirrored what he did in Jerusalem and, and basically uh, organized or not so much organized, but established his church the same way that he did in Jerusalem so that you no longer have just an Eastern Hemisphere religion or belief system. Now it's East and West both. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's an interesting way to look at it. That's why people of the Restoration have always tried to argue in favor of the Book of Mormon to other Bible believers to say that if this were, if we, if this is another witness, this is another testimony of Jesus and of your scriptures. That that and and so it is an interesting way to look at it because, you know, I tell people I said, you know, if if they find evidence of, uh, you know, uh, uh, evidence that's discovered by secular people. They don't have a dog in this fight, and it seems to indicate that there's that the Book of Mormon is true. Whether they find like uh, you know here lies Nephi or Welcome to Zarahemla, or any 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 evidence that it would it would fundamentally change everything. I wouldn't have to make a whole lot of changes because I'm kind of in this world anyhow. But there's gonna be a lot of evangelicals that are gonna have to come to me and say, okay, tell me about this Book of Mormon, Steve. You know, speak it, speak to me in even evangelicalese about what this book is all about, and I'd be able right. to do that. So that I, I have no idea if any of this is gonna happen, but I'm just saying that you know I, I'm definitely prepared for it if it were to happen. And you're you feel that you're being prepared to have to ha- for it to happen. And so this has become a very important thing in your life. Um, I, I just want to ask you, was there anything else about uh, the Hilcomore expedition you want to talk about? Are there any more slides that you want to share with my audience? Uh, maybe if you have a photo of 3D, uh, I mean, not 3D, uh, st- uh, what's his name? Um, uh, the gentleman. Uh, the, little yeah. Steedy. Steedy, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't have it in this other than the one that, um, uh, right here. Oh, okay. I can share. Yeah, just share real quick. Yeah, so I actually got to meet Stevie and hear him give a presentation, like I said uh, earlier, and it was a very fascinating, and he's obviously a very interesting individual, and uh, he is a person who's uh, been d- dedicated his life to this project. Um, I met his wife, and oh, that's him in the back. That's that's his back turned to us. That's, yeah, that's the back of his head there. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. That's so that's that's him. So that's um, Neil Steedy. Yeah, that's Neil. And, okay. Uh, unfortunately, this is the back of his head here. I'm sorry, Neil. I apologize to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I should have had should have had one for him. Uh, it's all right. So it's interesting. I am fascinated by what's happening in independence with the uh, with the independent restoration branches. Of course, I'm very fascinated that there's a community of Christ pastor who's spearheading uh, these 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 expeditions down. Uh, to southern Mexico to um, find evidence that would prove the Book of Mormon. You believe that you have found and identified the Hill Cumorah. Um, I want to ask you, David, if people wanted to join you for next year's expedition, is there mm-hmm. a place on your website that they could sign up for something like that? Because I imagine you'd be open to anybody who's our, a Book of Mormon person, regardless, and that's not a word, regardless of what... Uh, uh, denomination of uh, or flavor of restoration they are. You, it's probably open to anybody who'd be interested in coming. Is that correct? 
Actually, yeah, the, actually, the, the broader the representation of our group, I think it, the more it strengthens it. Um, because everyone comes into this with a perspective and <laughs> a, a facet, I guess, to, to look at it. And no one particular facet is complete in itself. You have to have multiple uh, inputs from multiple ways of looking at things and of digesting the information we get. So we put out a quarterly newsletter and on our web page, if you go to that, that newsletter, it's at the very bottom of the web page. Um, you can open it up and on the back page, I've got a email uh, you can call or um, you can write to, or I have my cell phone that you can call me and you can certainly talk with me and we can start talking about the possibilities of, of being a part of this. Well, why don't you pull up that image again of uh, what you believe is Hill, Hill Kimura? Why don't you pull that up in the slideshow? We'll give one more last look sure. for it so people can see it. Right there. You bet. Now, one thing I, I, wanna, I would like to wrap up with this particular thought, and that is we have spent the last, ever since 2005, we have spent now 18 years uh, researching, going all over. Let me get a drink here. Getting a scratchy throat. <clears throat> We've gone all over Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, uh, Salvador, Honduras, and we have gathered an incredible collection of evidences that basically fill out the geography of the Book of Mormon. And it's not just cities, but it's events like the move of the converted Lamanites from the, the land in the highlands to the land of Jershon. We can track that. We know when that happened and who was involved in that in the archaeology. Um, we know that it appears at least from the evidence in the Book of Mormon, we hear about King Anti-Nephi Lehi, mm -hmm. and we never hear from him again. We never hear about him after that original speech that's given about bearing their swords and not taking up the sword. Well, come to find out in the archaeology, we find out that he's decapitated. Um, the Ammonites uh, and the Amalekites and the Amalicites apparently were successful in getting enough of the Lamanites stirred up that they actually went in and part of the ones, the 1,005 who were killed uh, was apparently King Anti-Nephi-Lehi. Hmm. And we have found that the multiple references to that and we believe we have found where that took place and the fact that his decapitated body is buried in Tikal and the head was found in San Bartolo. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of pieces of the Book of Mormon story that get filled in because of the archaeology. And, and we've been spending all these years gathering all that evidence together and I believe God did this for a reason. He, he put us on this pathway because when the plates come out and the world goes, holy cow, what is this? Just like you're saying, you know, your ecumenic or your, uh, your friends are going to be saying, uh, what, what is this? Tell me about it. Come on, Stephen. What, what do you know about it? Well, the, everybody's going to be saying the same thing to us. And we will already have in place this comprehensive, um, I guess, parallel or story in the archaeology that would then overlay onto the, uh, the Book of Mormon story and be able to fill in the evidences, that truth that's come forth out of the earth for the people who are... Um, who are being moved by the Book of Mormon itself. I, I think that there's a huge, you know, a lot of the um, evangelicals are talking about this billion soul harvest that's coming. And I don't have a hard time believing that. I believe there's a huge move of God 
that is that is in the process of being prepared and we're walking through some dark times right now but on the other side of that is going to be this huge revelation and in the same way that the book of mormon um at the at the time of the destruction the book of, and christ's visitation then it says in the book of mormon that the whole land was believing in Jesus Christ. It was everywhere. Well, I think that same thing is going to be true about the world. It's going to be everywhere. And it's not the the odd man out isn't going to be the one who believes in Jesus. It's going to be the one who doesn't <laughs> um, at some point. Fascinating. Well, why don't you exit just, out of the screen share real quick? Okay. And then, and then uh, I'd like to just wrap this up and just thank you so much for coming on. So yeah, so you believe that, because of course, many people within the evangelical world believe that we are also are living in the latter days and that there is going to many, I know, that teach that there's going to be an end time harvest and that there will be uh, an end of days revivals. And so you, you're saying that these discoveries of these plates that would prove the Book of Mormon would actually go towards probably helping with those revivals and bringing people to Christ. And of course, you believe that Jesus did also uh, made an appearance here uh, in the past via what the Book of Mormon tells us. And you wrote a book about it, which I'm going to leave a link in the description of, uh, A Messiah Among the Maya, which you can buy on Amazon. And I want to thank you very much for sending me a copy, uh, David. And I want to thank you so much for coming on the program today. My pleasure. I, I love sharing it, and um, I, I hope that uh, your audience is their their curiosity is piqued by it. Because um, when we found when you ask the right questions and you put yourself in the position to receive it, God will fill your cup to overflowing. And um, so, the more curiosity you can arouse about this and and jump in. Um, I, you will be filled with joy in the things that you discover about it. So, yes, thank you very much. Well, this was interesting, folks. And I want to hear from my audience. You know, many of you are the people who believe that the Book of Mormon events took place in the in a Mesoamerican uh, format. Of course, many of you believe that the Heartlander model is the is the one. Um, but uh, I want to hear what you have to say about it. Very fascinating. I want to hear from evangelicals. What do you think? What would you do if there was evidence? that proved that the Book of Mormon was uh, authentic history. How would that change your worldview? And what would you do? I don't know. I'd be curious to hear your comments on that. I just remind all of you, uh, don't forget our merch store, mormonbookreviews.com, in which we have coffee mugs because or hot chocolate mugs, depending on where you land on the word of wisdom. Uh, and we got t-shirts, we got hats, you name it. It's at mormonbookreviews.com. Also, don't forget, for those of you who'd like to financially support the channel, we have links for Venmo, PayPal, as well as Patreon. And I want to thank all of you who are financially supporting the channel. Could not do it without you. But just remember, folks, this is the most important thing. Remember, all the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.